Welcome home. This is the Irish Roots Cafe where every day is a holiday and there's always room for one more. Come right this way. Have a seat with me today in the corner booth celebrating episode number 125 of the Irish Genealogy and History Show. Sweeney, clear the floor. Katie, bar the door one more time. Molly, put on another pot of Irish coffee and bring out the Irish dancers. It's time we get this show on the road. We've got another full house today. Not a chair to spare. I'm Michael Laughlin, your host. You can reach me anytime on my webpage at irishroots.com and check out the written show notes on my blog as well. You'll always want to do that. And uh, you can search all of our books and videos and podcasts on our webpage, too. So uh, that's fun, and it's free. And remember, you can phone 816-256-3360 to leave your comments on my recorder. Try it. You'll like it. You can also send me an email. Uh, Among today's topics, Warburton is the name of the day, Philadelphia Irish Link, Irish versus Scots-Irish, third in our series on genealogy. McGillicuddy for the Rose from County... Which county was that now? Uh, The Potato Famine Blight appears in the U.S. Eileen McGinnis has three generations in three minutes, and those are live births in the same hospital. Hey, Hey, smelly item at Bunratty Folk Park in County Clare. What in the world could that be about? Well, let's take a look now. Uh, one of our notes, we got it, we've got an easier week this week. Our notes for the week, uh, let me see, I got an email here. Uh, it says, Computers 101, using federal census records on Ancestry.com, Wednesday, September 23rd at the National Archives in Kansas City. Uh, Now, you can join the archive staff there for a free class at 9 a.m., and that's for you even if you don't know computers. So don't let that hold you back. Those people really help, and uh, they're all ages, so they can help you no matter who you are. And uh, you do need to reserve, though, so you reserve by email, or you can call them. And uh, if you don't have that on hand, I've got it on the blog there. Uh, Now we're going to move on to... The Book of the Month. Well, let me see. We'll just do a quickie here. Uh, We're going to make the Book of the Month because of our uh, name of the week. Kings and Queens County, Ireland, Genealogy and Family History Notes. And, uh, of course, that's on my webpage. I have a link on the blog. It gives a really good description with some place names and surnames and... uh, if we take a real quick look at that book, uh, the most common names, Kelly, Dunn, Daly, Egan, Malloy, Mooney, Carol, Walsh, Kinney, Murray, Dempsey, Kennedy, and Maher, or Maher, or Maher. I mean, you can spell those things so many different ways. Even Kelly. Kelly can have an E-Y at the end or a Y, or it can be an I-E instead of a Y. Uh, and you can add an E to the end of most of those names. So keep your eyes out, uh, especially when it comes to your surname. Well, what else we're going to do here today? I think we're going to move right on since we're in the uh, book section. We're going to take an excerpt from, really, it's from part of a uh, a new podcast series we're putting together here at the Irish Roots Cafe, and it's going to combine history and genealogy and all sorts of things. And Peter and I are working on it, so uh, I want you to stay tuned for that. But this is part three of our ten part series on Irish versus Scots Irish. And you'll also find notes on that in the uh, Guide to Irish Family Research that uh, if you sign up as a a full or a gold member, uh, you can get that as a free choice. So I want you to remember that next time you sign up. Now, basically what we say is, and the whole thing's written out nice and uh, nice and clean on the blog if you want to read it. But you should actually, uh, if you're going along and you're starting just beginning to research your family and you don't know a lot about it, uh, you're going to hear the term Scots-Irish, and you're going to wonder, well, what does that mean? And am I Scots-Irish? Is there any difference in the records? Should I be looking in different places if I'm Scots-Irish as opposed to uh, Old Irish? 
Uh, or what if I came from England? So it pays to do a little research, and this is just to help you beginners out there. Now, the north of Ireland is very close to Scotland, just across the waters, and the people there have intermingled for thousands of years. And uh, I guess a more use to us right now, just for genealogy purposes here, Scottish families were settled under the sponsorship of the British crown in the north of Ireland in the 17th century. And they're considered really a distinct group from the native Irish, and there's lots of reasons for that. And that's one of those stories for another day. Uh, and a good record of the land transfer and how the plan was set up to do this and uh, footnotes on the lifestyles uh, it can be found in the Conquest of Ireland, the Plantation in Ireland that I published in a four-book set earlier, and that's by the Reverend Hill. You can do some sorting by religion as a general rule. Most of the Scots-Irish that came to America, and I think that's where the term actually originated, was in America where people wanted to say, well, we're not one of the Irishmen getting off the ship, we're Scots-Irish, because there was a difference in the heritage. They came to America, Canada, Australia, and most of them were Presbyterian. And they were the Irish, of course, the native Irish, were Catholic. So that's one, one way you can sort of define if you think they were Catholic or Protestant. That's sort of a big division there. It's not 100%, but it's pretty close. And the Scots-Irish are generally credited with coming to America uh, earlier than the, the Irish, they made their mark in the late 1600s and the 1700s in America, and they're noted for the settlement on the Appalachian front frontier. Now, you might say they were known for being very hardy pioneers uh, like Daniel Boone. Now, the native Irish, they arrived in much greater numbers in America and, and I think everywhere else. They are known for settling in the 1800s, which, of course, peaked with the Great Famine in 1847. And uh, these Irish were the largest foreign-born group in America from the years 1800 to 1850 in total. And they settled mainly in the cities. And you know what? During the heart of that famine there, as it was wrapping up, there were more Irish in New York City than there were in Dublin, Ireland. And during the hard famine years, that's also when you can find the Irish... Uh, occupying the first ghettos in every major city in America. And that's with just one exception. Do you know what city that would be that didn't have uh, all those Irish huddled together in, uh, in, in the tenements, so to speak? Well, it was Salt Lake City. Uh, but you know what? We'll go back to the two groups, the Irish and the Scots-Irish. Either, either one of the two groups can be found coming into America, Canada, or Australia at any time. But the time frame I've just mentioned is helpful, helpful in making an educated guess. And the religion is a quick tip to the or origin of the family, but it's not perfect either. Uh, you know, when you were out there living on the frontier, you might be lucky to have uh, one denomination available to you or one circuit rider. And, you know, after a generation or so, for sure, the distinction between uh, uh, denominations might fade a little bit. And you can find both groups making a switch to the other side occasionally. And that's maybe out of necessity. And you can also find things like I ran into two Reverend Hogan's that were preaching in the same area in the uh, uh, Middle West on the frontier. But they both had different ref uh, religious affiliations. And I, I've read some notes where it said the people were real excited to welcome Reverend Hogan in. And uh, when they got there, they found out he was the raw and reg Reverend Hogan. So... I don't know if they go ahead, went ahead and gave them the apple pie that they made or not. Uh, I bet they would have done it because they were pretty friendly out there most of the time. And, you know, sometimes records can be better for the Scots or the English uh, landowners or settlers in Ireland. And they can also be found concentrated in certain areas like, uh, like around the Pale in Dublin or in Northern Ireland, like we just mentioned. And uh, church records are very key to research in Ireland, so determining your family's religious affiliation can point you into some pretty important directions. Now, you know, there's many names that are recognized as Irish or Scots-Irish or even English, and that can be helpful too, but don't jump up too quickly and think you've, found, you've solved the uh, puzzle until you look at it for a while. 
Almost every English name can be found in Ireland. And you might say, well, that clinches it. I've got an English name. I'm an English family that's settled in Ireland. But all those English names were adopted almost by the Irish uh, uh, for several different reasons. Some of it was translating their names, the old Irish names, into English forms, the form of the day. And it got pretty confusing because, well, especially after the famine, you know, they say that uh, there were over 4 million Irish speakers before the famine, and after the famine, there was less than 1 million, and they were mainly the older folks. And uh, it really it really wiped out the Irish language uh, uh, and its possibilities for growth into the future. Uh, but that was also a reason why these names changed so much. If they're coming out of the Gaelic into the English, you either pick something that was a translation of the meaning of, or you could have just picked a name you liked or the name that was phonetically similar to yours. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but just remember, your name can be a big help in finding your family in Ireland. And uh, that'll do it for our special entry for the day. And just want to remind you, we do have uh, a blog reader and a podcast. Both of those are audios. And the blog reader is a computer reading the, reading my blog. And the podcast is me speaking live into that microphone. And you can get the podcast uh, on my webpage at irishroots.com. And just click on, uh, uh, for this podcast, the Irish Families Podcast, the Irish Roots Cafe. And uh, you'll be able to get it right away. Just click on the title of the show that you like and it'll play. And you don't need to have uh, an iPod. All you have to do is have a computer nowadays, and it works just fine. It'll play right then and there. Uh, Hey, coming up later, we're going to talk a little bit about Phytophthora infestans, and it's raising its ugly head again. And if you really have studied things about Irish history, you might know what that means. Now I think it's time to raise our eyes skyward, give thanks, and ask for help. Here are today's Magnificent Seven. Number one, Josephine Byrne of Vaud, Switzerland. Boy, we don't get too many orders from Switzerland. That's a real treat, uh, Josephine. Uh, Your names in the Land Grants of Ireland book has shipped along with all those other titles you got. Uh, Number two, Joshua Mullins of Mosini, Wisconsin. Your hardback families of County Clare, Ireland has shipped. Let me reach into the hopper here and pull another one out. Uh, Richard Milligan of Apache, Arizona. Your book of Irish families, great and small, has shipped. And Elizabeth Gravel or Gravel of Russell, Canada, your families of County Donegal, Ireland, has shipped. And uh, hey, Big River Distribution of St. Louis, Missouri, your Missouri Irish books, the original history of the Irish in Missouri, uh, has shipped. Thank you for distributing this title of ours. Appreciate the help. Number six, Jacqueline Ahrens of Washington. Your item has shipped. Thanks for the phone call and good to hear from you again. You know, I looked it up and by golly, you go all the way back to at least 1989 in my notes. So uh, uh, you're one of our oldest uh, uh, patrons here and I sure do appreciate it. Number seven, Gould Genealogy of Australia. Thank you for ordering and uh, uh, stocking many of my books here as soon as they get there. Lots of folks in Australia listen in and order the books, and uh, you're going to have some books in stock there. Not all of them, but a whole bunch of them in the next month or two, so I wanted to let everybody know about that and say thanks. And while I'm, while I'm saying thanks, I wanted to thank all of our members because, as I tell you each week, without you, these podcasts would not be possible. This is just a little deal between me and you, and... Uh, uh, that's what keeps me going, your memberships and uh, your book orders. Well, let's move now on to the uh, family name of the day. Well, the family name of the day is Warburton. And this is in honor of uh, member Hugh Watson uh, looking for the Warburton family name. And uh, that's his grandmother's and traced back to Richard Warburton of Gary Hinch in the King's County. Uh, Now, if you take a look at related spellings of the name, it's going to sound the same, but it might start out with a W-O-R or a W-A-R for Warburton. 
And the same thing with Burton. That can end with a uh, E-N, a I-N, or a O-N. Uh, it's the sound of the name that counts, and we all know that. Uh, now, let me see if we take a little. Let's take a look at some of the sources we've got for uh, War Burton. There's not a whole lot in the Book of Irish Families, just a note there. So I'll move on to the uh, Irish Family uh, Coats of Arms, and I'll check the Irish Book of Arms. Let's see here. Well, here it is, War Burton. And that's given in the I Irish Book of Arms, and, and it's illustrated. And that's a good thing. So it is in the Irish Book of Arms. And, uh, hey, you know what else we got coming up later in this episode? We've got an old Irish famine uh, film. And it throws some words up on the, sc on the screen that ask questions about what you're seeing in that film. Now, the film was actually taken in 1905 during a, a different famine period in Ireland. But, boy, it looks so similar. Uh, and they put some nice uh, music in the background. I think that music was by Enya. But it's definitely worth looking at, and it might make you think more than once. Now, uh, let's take a look at the free master index search of Irish names for Warburton. Uh, we find it about 15 times. And uh, it's in uh, the Book of Irish Families, Great and Small, as I mentioned. You can also find it in the f index to the families of County Kerry, Ireland, uh, in the Milesian families of Ireland. And we find a R. Warburton in Kings and Queens County, Ireland, genealogy and family history notes. And we also find it in our County Fermanagh uh, book. And lastly, in the 1659 Census of Ireland. Well, now it's time to take a look at the websites of the week. Well, our first pick is going to be uh, a little blog there that was on the Irish Diaspora in Philadelphia, Part 1. They may have Part 2 up by now. I don't know. But if you're looking in Philadelphia, that might be of interest. Uh, number 2, Irish historian Don, Dom McGlynn on the Brennans of Donegal. I'm not sure if I put that one up before or not, but it's an interesting tale. And number three, uh, Clara County Offaly, Ireland, an old family video. And, of course, County Offaly is Kings County, and that's sort of our theme for this week. And number four is that old Irish famine film set to music. Uh, so I want you to take advantage and take a look at that. It's well worth your time. Well, now it's time for everybody's favorite. We're just zipping along this week, and... Uh, it's a good thing, too, because I've got so much recording to do. It's uh, I'm setting a record, you know. Now it's time for Curious News and Notes. Number one, Leprechaun what? Bunratty Folk Park in County Clare, one of my favorite places to stop when I'm, I'm down there in that area. And they've forgot, perhaps gotten a little bit off track, but then... They're trying to sell to Americans, so maybe it fits the bill. I don't know. But they're selling leprechaun poo uh, for 2.95 euros, and it's guaranteed to be 100% organic. Uh, uh, brings a chill to my spine. Uh, <laughs> but I've got a link on the blog to the Bunratty uh, Folk Park. Uh, maybe they're needing our help. Number two. That fungus, or or they also say it might be a umacite or something like that, but the name of it was Phytophthora infestans, and that's what caused the Irish famine blight, and it's back this time in America, and uh, it affects both tomatoes and potatoes, and among the areas hit in America are Rhode Island, New York, and Massachusetts. Now, you know, some home gardeners have gotten seeds that are infected with that, and uh, uh, that's helped spread it all over the place. They pulled it off the shelves, but uh, it's too late now. And, you know, and it's sort of like uh, in that original famine, uh, those potatoes were take, taken from the central Mexican highlands, and they, and they were shipped up to, I think it was New York and a few other places, and then shipped overseas. I think it might have been to Belgium, and then it spread all over, and... Uh, Ireland sure got it starting in 1845, and by 1847, they were sure in a mess. Uh, but I think we've got it under control here. Everybody knows a little bit more about it and how to control it. 
Uh, number three, the first Ford plant built outside the United States was in County Cork, Ireland, according to a couple of emails I've gotten. And that was in 1921, and they made the Ford tractor. Number four, three generations born within 30 minutes. Now, here's a really against the odds story. Eileen McGinnis is 85 years old, and she has 16 children. Now, she recently had a grandson, a great-grandson, and a great-great-grandson born within minutes of each other at the same hospital in Dublin. I think that was within 30 minutes or so of each other. And that's pretty amazing. I don't know if anybody's ever done that before. That I read about that first in the uh, independent.ie, and I've got a link on the blog, but boy, oh boy, can you imagine that? Number five, they found some timber circles uh, that are about 4,000 years old. They've been carbon dated, uh, found in uh, County Tyrone uh, near Ballygally. And, uh, boy, that's an amazing thing. Nobody still really knows what those circles were for. Uh, Some say it was for feasting. Others say it was for commemorating the dead. Uh, You might take a guess. Maybe somebody just wanted to have the first brick circle on the the block and uh, built their house that way. I don't know. Could have been the chief's house. Uh, Your guess is as good as mine, but I've got a link to that story on the blog. And number six, Margaret O'Keefe was the last official Rose of Tralee winner that came from County Kerry back in 1964. Now, the odds were three to one that Kerry McGillicuddy would become the next Rose of Tralee from County Kerry this year. And, you know, I also heard a few people complaining that uh, uh, the Rose of Tralee is an Irish event, and uh, now they're getting all these entries from everywhere else in the world, and... uh, You know, is that fair to Ireland? The Rose of Tralee not even being from Ireland? Uh, I can understand the point, but it sure is good that you're gracious enough to sell the celebration, to save the celebration uh, with us. And I guess if you don't already do it, you could always have two, one being the Rose of Tralee from Ireland and one being the Rose of Tralee from the Diaspora. Now, wouldn't that be a poetic thing? You're probably already doing it, so... uh, I won't waste any more of my silly ideas. Uh, But you know what? That does it. I want you to remember to send me your comments by email or by clicking on the contact link on our webpage. And uh, remember, we're also uh, broadcasting this podcast on Irish Central, Central irishcentral.com. We've got uh, a blog uh, going on there, too. So uh, that's been a lot of fun, and I hope that works out. And you can also send it to our uh, mail address at uh, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. That's at the Irish Roots Cafe. And you can leave me your message or report on things in your part of the world when you call my phone recorder at 816-256-3360. And you can also Skype me at Irish Roots Cafe. I'm on MySpace and Facebook and Twitter and Irish uh, Central, like I said, so... We're easy to get a hold of if you really want to. And members foot the bill so they get first priority, but we're open to all. And by the way, a big thank you to all of our members. And away. Uh,